Welcome to the second program in this year's Stories to Share season. I am Joe Steinfield. I am the moderator of the program. How many of you are here for the first time? Quite a few. Well, we welcome you. Uh, this is our fourth season. And please come back. As you'll see, we are on number two up at the top with seven remaining the first Friday of each month through next June. I want to first thank our sponsors, Beltetz, the Monadnock Ledger Transcript, and the Savings Bank of Walpole that seems to have fallen off the screen, but we appreciate their support. <clears throat> Welcome to summer in New Hampshire. Today's speaker uh, grew up in a very civilized place west of Philadelphia. And he went off to college in Syracuse and was a member of the first class at the Newhouse School, a famed school of journalism. So he picked journalism as a career when he was quite young. But then he went into the Peace Corps and he went to South America near the equator and he hated how hot it was. <laughs> he dreamt of snow. And uh, after that, he got in a car and he ended up driving to Maine in a snowstorm and he became a school teacher and detour still from journalism. But in 1979, he joined Yankee Magazine, where he had already published one or more pieces, and he has been there ever since. And for the last 15 or 16 years, he has been the editor of Yankee Magazine. And over the years, he's written about practically everything. <laughs> Home, food, travel, my favorite, fishing, and other subjects. And uh, in case you haven't, in case you haven't seen it, this issue of Yankee Magazine, Small Towns, Big Color, has a wonderful article, curiously called Small Towns, Big Color. And it's sort of a meandering journey through the towns of the Monadnock region by someone who obviously has an ongoing love affair with this part of the world. And for those of you who did not see yesterday's <laughs> ledger transcript, wonderful picture of our speaker with his dog. I don't see the dog. <laughs> Uh, called A Lifetime of Stories. And we are so fortunate, and I am so pleased to introduce the editor of Yankee Magazine, Mel Allen. By the way, Joe, when I was eight years old, my Christmas present was a little printing press. That's the truth, and I put out a little newspaper for the neighborhood at eight years old, so. <laughs> Syracuse was way down the line after that. So I wanna thank everyone um, for being here this evening, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this series, Joe. I have lived in the Monadnock region since I came to Yankee in 1979, and besides its mountain and villages and lakes, there's this current of social and cultural awareness that enriches all of us, and you, Joe, are part of what's created this special thing here, so thank you for that. I want you to know that the PowerPoint images that we're gonna see soon were put together before I wrote this speech. So if you Google words, number of words for 45 minutes, it comes out to 5,700. When I finished, I had a little more than that. So 
I may have to skip over some of the pictures, but it, they were, I, it kills me to do it, but um, maybe there'll be a part two in a couple of years. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for the next 45 minutes or so, you will hear me say I quite a bit because I'm talking about people and places I have known during my time at Yankee. But as anybody who has worked in publishing knows so well, the byline on a story is a result of many hands. So I've been fortunate in working with so many exceptional writers, editors, art directors, photo editors, fact checkers, and production people who make sure that the pages get sent to printers and then to your homes. They are my friends, and even a better friend when they let me know if my story can be better with one more try, no matter how much I object. <laughs> Some of these people are here here tonight, and it means so much for me to see you here. When I write about other people, I spend many hours, often days, with them. And they will tell me their story as they open up their lives. The words they speak become like little intimate albums I get to keep. In essence, for a time, they become part of my life, too. When they see you are not there for just a quick hello and goodbye, when they see you listening really intently, they may tell you details of their lives that they may not have said to anyone else. It does not matter if the other is famous and used to interviews like Stephen King or the astronaut Alan Shepard or Anais Mitchell, the creator of Hadestown, the Tony Award winning musical, or America's greatest ski racer, the New Hampshire native Bodie Miller. If you ask the right questions, if you show you have done the work to know about them, you may get surprising and compelling intimacy. But in many ways, the greatest gift is being able to tell our readers about people whose stories you would never have known if Yankee had not paid a visit. My first story for Yankee was published in 1977, and I am a keeper of things to the dismay of those around me. I have notebooks and tape recordings of enough people to populate a small village. I could no more choose a favorite as I could pick out favorite photos of my two now grown boys when they were children. But if you remember the popular Reader's Digest feature, my most unforgettable character, well, that's a bit like what I've done here. Now, nobody knows the name Ralph Thomas. Sports writers usually call today's athletes heroes after they've done some feat. And so many of our athletes have trainers, special workout facilities, not to mention lucrative lives. Now, I want to tell you about Ralph Thomas. He was an indigenous member of Maine's Penobscot Nation. When I met him in the late 1970s, he was about to set off to run a marathon in Niagara Falls. He had worked his shift in a broiler house near Lewiston, Maine, hauling live chickens from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. He showered and was on the road by 11 in the morning. He drove alone to Rochester, New York for 12 hours. He stopped and napped for five hours, then set off for the race, arriving at 11 a.m., half an hour before the start. His time that day was two hours, 32 minutes, placing him 19th out of 2,200 runners. I was the last journalist to see the pioneer homesteader Scott Nearing at the homestead he shared with his wife, Helen, in Harborside, Maine. Their subsistence lifestyle and their book, Living the Good Life, attracted a legion of followers, one of whom was Edie Clark, Yankee's beloved columnist who recently passed away. They made the shelters they lived in. They built magnificent stone walls. It was a low stress, common sense way to live and has been credited with being the first, making the first surge of back to landers in the 60s and the 70s come to New England. The young pilgrims who journeyed to their homestead so they were seeking guidance in defining their lives. What they, what they were handed was a hoe, a shovel, a wheelbarrow, an ax. Here's guidance, the Nearings said. The Nearings always ate from one wooden bowl 
with a single wooden spoon apiece. Every day they ate what they called Scott's emulsion, spoonfuls of peanut butter and a thick dropper of honey. It would be worked together like cement. Then they would scoop millet on top and apple slices. When I visited them, Helen showed me a letter from a man who had read their classic, Living the Good Life. He said it had inspired him. He bought one wooden bowl. He bought one wooden spoon. His wife divorced him, Helen said. <laughs> she said she wasn't going to live like a dog. When Scott reached 100 and could no longer do the work of his lifetime, he decided it was time to leave his good life. He would no longer take nourishment, except Helen's honey and herbal tea mix from a spoon. This is when I came to see them, at that fragile time. He lay in a hospital bed in their main room. Helen's cot was beside him. I've never known him a day sick in his bed, she told me. Never, never. We've never had a doctor. He was still working outside just a little while ago. But one morning, he just took to his bed and started to sleep. It was November, like he was hibernating. He was restless for a time, shouting out suddenly at night. Now he's contented. He doesn't complain, but sometimes he'll look at me wistfully and say, I wish I could carry the wood in for you. I thought I could take care of him, but I fell with him once when I realized I couldn't. I just, I just bawled because I thought I had to put Scott near him in a home. We went to a home for a while. They were very nice, but this is where he belongs. Scott died soon after my visit. I spoke again with Helen. It was 10 in the morning. I was in the cot with him. I said, it's all right. Go, go into the light. You've lived a long and beautiful life. It's time to go now, and that's all right. We'll get along. And he just said, all right, and he just went. I was so glad for him, he didn't want to keep on. I was a much younger writer then, but this kind of connection with someone does not fade over the years. For a story I called The Outsider, I met with William Cohen, who then was Maine's Republican senator and later became President Clinton's Secretary of Defense. He was notorious for his independence in a Congress that valued loyalty. In 1974, only a year removed from being mayor of Bangor, Bill Cohen had cast a tie-breaking vote to order President Nixon to turn over tapes crucial to the impe impeachment hearing. He became accustomed to hate mail. Imagine if we had social media then. Before I met with the senator, I spent a day and long night into early morning in the Bangor Kosher Bakery with his father, Reuben as he made the bagels and rye bread. Bill Cohen's mother was Irish Protestant from Arusta County. My focus for the story was how Bill Cohen's life had led him to his independence, to not being fearful of consequences. When I met him, I first started talking about my night with Reuben at the bakery. Then Bill Cohen opened up to me. He talked about growing up and seeing signs on beaches no Jews or dogs allowed. When he was a little league pitcher, in one game he was wild and hit two players. Someone threw a beer can at him. He remembers the cry, send the Jew boy home. It's one of those things you never forget, he said. You're 12 years old, standing alone on the pitcher's mound, and people are throwing things at you. I don't know what drove me, he said. Part of it undoubtedly came from my split heritage. To please my father, I started Hebrew school when I was six, but I knew immediately I was different. To most Gentiles, I was a Jew. To Jews, I was always a Gentile. On either side, I was the outsider, part of each, whole of neither. And then he told me about a turning point he had never talked about before. Just before he was supposed to be bar mitzvah, he went to the banks of the Penobscot River, and he took off the small Jewish ritual object called a mezuzah he had worn for years around his neck. 
and he flung it into the river. He did not go through, he did not go through with the ceremony. That story was picked up by Reader's Digest and many newspapers. To me, it showed me a public figure could open up and be vulnerable. I doubt I would have heard this story if I had not first spent the night seeing his dad make rye bread and bagels. I could spend the evening telling so many more like this, but I want to show some special people and tell a little bit about the stories I learned from them. This, of course, is Stephen King. He was then in his early 30s, as I was. When I saw him, he had published Carrie, Salem's Lot, The Shining, and The Stand had just come out. He was famous, but he was not yet the most famous writer in America. I had first known Stephen when we lived near each other in Maine. I was a freelance writer for the Maine Sunday Telegram. He had just written his first two books. I spent a day with him then, and then came back for a story on his wife, Tabby, who was also a writer for the weekly women's section at the paper. They actually had a women's section back then. <laughs> One day he phoned me. He needed help rounding up pigs he kept who had gotten out. So I'm probably one of the few writers who sloshed through mud holding piglets with Stephen King. <laughs> so we had a little history for the Yankee story. I knew I did not want to do a sit down question and answer. I always want a scene or multiple scenes to help, to help me frame the person. That's how a reader gets to know them. That's what they do, not just the words they say. He, that day, he was to spend the day at the high school where he had been teaching when he wrote Carrie at a little, a little school outside of Bangor. It's where he taught Bram Stoker's Dracula, which gave him the inspiration to set a vampire story in a small main town. I spent the day with him in the high school, then went back with him to his house in Bangor. This was one of the first times anyone had written in depth about the long road he had traveled and all the rejections he had kept before he found success and fame. He said, when I started Carrie, I had finished my first year of teaching. I was working in summer at the laundry to try and make ends meet. I started writing, but after four pages, I thought it stank and I threw it in the rubbish. I came home and I found my wife Tabby had taken them out and had left a note. Please keep going. It's good. Since she's really stingy with her praise, I did. <laughs> when I finished it, I sent it off to Doubleday. We were having a really tough time. We had two small children. Our phone had been taken out. When the telegram came saying it was accepted with a 2,500 advance, Tabby had to call me at my school from across the street. I was in the middle of a teacher's meeting and my, I was on pins and needles waiting to get home and hug her. Later, my agent told me the paperback rights were bought for $400,000. I said, you mean $40,000? He said, no, I mean $400,000 and I realized I wouldn't have to teach anymore. <laughs> my mother was dying then, but she knew everything was going to be all right. She was old fashioned about Carrie. She didn't like the sex parts. But she recognized that a lot of Carrie had to do with bullying. If there's a moral in the book, it's don't mess around with people. You never know what, who you may be tangling with. And he said, ah, if my mother had lived, she would have been queen of Durham, Maine by now. And he ended, he ended this way. We had lunch at the Wardorf with people who bought the movie rights to The Shining. We sat in leather chairs. Mine was dedicated to George M. Cohan because it was where he used to sit and compose. The waiters are all French. They glide over to you. And we sat around the table talking seriously about people to play roles in the movie. What do you think about Robert De Niro for the father? Someone says. Somebody else says, I think Jack Nicholson would be terrific. And I say, don't you think Nicholson is too old for the part? And so it goes. We're tossing around these names from the fan magazines, except it's for real. Then I come back to Maine and pick up the toys and check if the kids are brushing in the back of their mouths. And I'm smoking too many cigarettes. 
and chewing aspirin alone in this office and the glamour people aren't there. There's a curious loneliness, he said. You have to produce day after day and you have to deal with doubt that when, what you're producing is trivial and besides not even good. So in a way, when I go there to New York City, I feel like I've earned it. I'm getting my due. This is Alan Shepard. I saw him in Houston. That's Alan Shepard as a boy. <laughs> I saw him in Houston on the 20th anniversary of his Apollo 14 moon landing when he famously hit a golf ball, the longest drive in mankind. <laughs> he said, you know, I've been inundated with requests for interviews because of this anniversary, and I've turned them down, except for short bits on the phone. But Yankee is different. Yankee is unique. It's home. Before I saw him in Houston, I visited his hometown of Derry, New Hampshire. I spoke to one of his grade school teachers, who then was now long retired. I talked to a former teacher of his at Pinkerton Academy. So when we met, I was able to talk with him about his childhood. And on the second day I saw him, he told me about his father. In 1959, when Alan was selected as one of the original Mercury astronauts, his father, who was a prosperous and successful banker, tried hard to dissuade him. He made the point that his son was on path to one day make Admiral. And to him, this astronaut endeavor, or foolishness as he said, was not only dangerous, it was foolish. Alan Shepard was known as the most cool as ice of all the original astronauts. He rarely showed emotion. But when he told me about returning from the moon and his father coming over to him and hugging him and saying, I was wrong. Tears welled up and he could not speak for a few moments. On my wall in my office is a signed photograph that he sent me of him on the moon. There's no important lesson here at all, except I'd like to show off that I know Ted Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Recalled this fun story, Fishing Buddies. This was in the early fall in the fabled Atlantic Salmon River, the Miramichi in New Brunswick. I was at his fishing camp. He famously did not trust and openly detested the press. We had a mutual friend, the outdoor columnist for the Bangor Daily News, that's him on the right, Bud Levitt. Ted had invited Bud to the camp. They were longtime fishing buddies, and Bud invited me. Was I a little intimidated to go? Yes, I was. When we walked in, we were about 45 minutes late. When Bud had said we'd be there, and Ted, who was notoriously impatient, was already finishing up his pasta. You're late, he barked. You spoiled my dinner. Then he looked at me, not fondly. <laughs> you can stay here, he said, on one condition. Ask interesting questions. This is Richard Phillips, Captain Richard Phillips. It was April 2009 when Somali pirates boarded the merchant tanker Maersk, Alabama, and took Captain Richard Phillips hostage. That was the drama that riveted the world. Eight months after the rescue, I saw Phillips and his wife, Andrea, at their home in Underhill, Vermont. We sat together in his 1840s farmhouse. He took me through hour by hour of his dramatic ordeal, but what I want to share here is a ve very human stories I get to hear. I asked Andrea, who was an emergency room nurse in Burlington, how she kept going during that harrowing week when the world watched the drama play out. And she told me about the moon. Quote, he'd always send me a postcard from somewhere in the world where he'd been traveling. And he sent me one postcard that said, I'll see you in the moon. And it became this little thing because no matter where he was in the world, we'd still sit under one moon. And as our kids were young, I always wanted to keep Richard very much in their lives because at two or three years old, it's out of sight, out of mind. 
would always say good night to Daddy's moon, because I'd always say, Daddy's looking up and looking at you off the moon. So that really just became a symbolic thing in our family when he was away. And the fact that all this happened under a full moon was just like, wow. I'd go to bed every night, and the moon was just outside our bedroom window. So just before I pulled the shade, I could see that moon, and I sent my thoughts to Richard via the moon. I think deep down inside, I was hoping he was thinking the same thing. We're both under the same moon. We're in this together. Hmm. What a lovely woman. Her name was Connie Small. She was one of the last of the wives of a lighthouse keeper. She lived on Avery's Rock, the most desolate lighthouse three miles out in Machias Bay, Maine. There was no earth, only a half acre of boulders and a wooden plank leading from the house to the boat slip. She was 21 years old when she went there. There was no phone, no electricity. Rain washed off the roof into cisterns stored beneath the pantry. She saw only Elsa, her husband Elsa. And at night, while she knit socks or sewed quilts or bedding or clothes, she would twist the radio dial, hoping to hear another voice, however faint it might be. She told me about the time she blistered the skin off her hands when her husband Elson was away and the bell broke down during a storm. I untied the rope. We needed to ring the bell by hand when we saluted the lighthouse tender. I pulled that rope for an hour and a half. I knew Elson was out there. This is Bert Southwick. Now here we are, as far away from the celebrity profile as you can possibly find. <laughs> His name is Bert Southwick. Every Friday since 1937, he put a harness on his horse, climbed into a buggy, and delivered fresh eggs. It's an example of how you can tell a story by simply being there. When the person is doing what he loves, and to let them know that you think their story is important. Here's a little snippet from that story. There can't be many farmers in New England more well known or loved by neighbors than Bert Southwick, who lives in the same farmhouse his parents found in 1918 on a ridge set back from Zion Hill Road in Northfield, New Hampshire. Except for a stint with the National Guard in the late 1940s, he has spent every night of his 84 years on this ridge. For years, Bert's egg route covered some 200 stops, scattered over a six to eight mile route that would take him all day, what with kids feeding apples to his horse and small talk with customers. In time, a lot of them moved away or died, but he still delivers at least 100 dozen eggs a week. He figures he sold close to six million eggs. If you add up the miles he's clip-clopped down these roads, he's crossed America eight times. In 1995, when a new elementary school was built on land he and his family had cleared years ago, the children asked that it be named Burt Southwick School. At the entrance is an engraved sign showing Burt's famous cart and horse. There was a horse and wagon who named the school, he says, not me. I find Bert in the barn, carrying hay to his horses. Good morning, I say. Where'd you find a good one, he answered. When the barn chore is finished, he squeezes through the narrow front door into the warm kitchen. His knees are shot. And if he sits for a while, he rises stiffly before picking up momentum. So he doesn't sit much, except to sort his eggs and pick feathers off them here in the kitchen, which is heated with the same black Glenwood stove his father bought after World War I for $35. That stove and a wood furnace below have warmed him both, have since warmed him both. I asked about backup heat. 
before he readies his eggs. And he gave me one of my favorite quotes ever. Back up is me putting in more wood, he said. <laughs> if I ever write fiction, a character is going to say that, I promise you. I'm going to show you two slides here. This is Sandy Mancy. Burlington, Vermont. I was in the Science and Nature Museum by Lake Champlain. And I saw the exhibit devoted to Champ, the legendary sea creature that for generations has sparked debate. Is it real? There was this famous photo, the only photo ever seen of something in the lake that after being scrutinized by teams of experts had never been debunked. Whatever that camera showed, this was reality. It said the photo was taken by Sandy Mancy on July 5th, 1977. I wondered what happened to the woman who took that photo. All serious discussion of whether something unexplainable lives in Lake Champlain starts with Sandy Mancy's single image taken with a Kodak Instamatic. Discover Magazine once called her photo the Rosetta Stone of Champology. <laughs> When I came to see her at her home in Bristol, Vermont, I wasn't interested in whether CHAMP was real or not. Though several funded scientific explorations had found something in the lake that sent out signals that a sonar detected that could not be explained by fish alone. I wanted to know what had happened to Sandy Manson. And she said this to me, you know, nobody has ever asked me how what I saw changed me. Nobody. I was sitting down the embankment, she told me. I was looking out at the lake, and I could see a turbulence, like how a school of fish might look. I went, wow, that's a big school of fish. Wouldn't my grandfather like to look at this? And pretty soon, the head and the neck broke the surface. And I thought, whoa, that's one heck of a sturgeon. I <laughs> I knew what a sturgeon was. They're absolutely huge, but they're not that big. And then the head came up, and then the neck came up, and then I could see the back, and the whole time I was thinking, what is that? I picked the camera up, and the creature looked over its back, and I took the picture. Then the back went down, the neck went down, the head went down. And the New York Times published the photograph, Sandy Mancy, Grace for the response. There was a lot of naysayers, she told me. Many said I was lying. I had done something with the photo. I knew I had to have the conviction to say, okay, this is what I saw. You tell me what it was. Sandy Mancy's story ended like this. I know this. Lake Champlain has something, a secret, a hidden treasure, and it's wonderful. And it's magnificent. Even if you don't believe it, it's there. Someday I'll be vindicated and people will say, remember that old lady from Vermont? <laughs> I, I'm trying to see how I'm doing for time because I don't, I don't want to skip people yet. How am I doing for time, Joe? I can't see that. What's the clock say? Okay. This is Rosie. I include this photo of Rosie, an old arthritic elephant, because it comes with a story as improbable as any I have ever done. And it ended after my story was published, not in the way I could ever have imagined. But I have it here because it is an example of how if you were drawn to this work of writing about others, you can find stories emerge from something as simple as going to a country store in a small town, in this case, Hope, Maine, for a bottle of water. Anyone here from Pennsylvania knows I say water. I'm sorry. Yeah. Say <laughs> and then seeing a donation jar that said, bring Rosie to Hope. I then asked, what does that mean? And I found out. I learned about a popular local vet named Jim Marita. As a youth, he had joined the circus and took care of elephants. 
He worked with them around the world. One elephant, Rosie, this Rosie, was his favorite. Now she was old, arthritic, and lived on some southern elephant farm receiving minimal care. His idea was to raise money to build a therapeutic center in this main village for old elephants. They were no longer wanted by circuses. If caring and knowledge and science could give Rosie a better life, Jim Lorita wanted to try it. High-end physical therapy, Jim told me, the kind that they do with racehorses. Ultrasound, hydrotherapy, acupuncture, nutritional support. It's never been tried before. Jim Lorita told his hope neighbors about this idea, this audacious idea. It's like in Peterborough, having an elephant farm in Peterborough. <laughs> and the calls began to come. What can we do? A video showed Rosie walking painfully, slowly. She became more than a project. She became real, an animal who needed them. Raising money for Rosie became Hope's mission. Donations reached $100,000, enough to borrow the remaining $200,000 for a heated barn and a double steel fence. Jim Lorita told me his dream was Hope would be a center for learning about elephants, about the need to save them like the great whales. They were endangered, he notes, and through awareness, they came back. This have all the makings of a based on a true story movie. And something happened. I'm not going to say it here. If you ask me a question afterwards, it, it, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is not a fancy story. This is the Poor Family Farm, Poor Bean, P-O-O-R-E-E, -E, in Stewartston, New Hampshire. I saw this historical homestead through the eyes of two men, Rick Johnson and Mark Weiner. They told me about Kenneth Poor, who you see, who, whoop, who you see standing here. He had been born in 1885 and he died in 1983. He lived on this land his entire life. And think of this, everything his grandfather had ever owned Everything his father had ever owned, everything Kenneth Poor had ever touched, all that was still there. Nothing had been recreated and nothing had been thrown away. I began the story this way. I've written a lot of stories. This is my all-time favorite beginning. You gotta like this. Imagine a house that held everything that you'd ever touched. The books you read, diaries and journals, your toys, your clothes, your shoes, the board games you played, and the jigsaw puzzles you pieced together on winter nights by the glow of lantern light, baseballs plucked from the weeds after Fourth of July games, when the town men challenged the country boys, the quilts that warmed you as a child, and they still warmed you now that you're old, the school papers you wrote, the maps that showed a world that seemed too big to ever grasp, the letters and cards that friends and family sent you telling of births and deaths and news from afar, the clothes you wore as a child and those you wore as a grown-up, the newspapers that recounted the comings and goings in your town from the day you were born to the day you died, magazines with cover stories on President Teddy Roosevelt, every button that ever fell off, every fragment of cloth and string Pots that boiled beans and pans that fried bacon. Tools that helped you make a living. Carts and buggies and horseshoes and harnesses and yokes for oxen. Receipts for anything you ever bought. They each tell a story of hard times, deeper than the numbers. Then imagine that same house holding the life of your grandfather and of your father, who was born in 1835, and your mother, a sister, a brother, all the things needed to live a hard scrabble life in a five bedroom home that had never known indoor plumbing, electricity, or running water, where the local where the food was cold in a room that stood above a clear cold spring. All the things that entered your life never ever left because of because if you paid for something, you needed it. And if you needed it, there would be always be a way to use it. Always the leather sole of a boot worn to the nub would resurface as a door hinge, a piece of wire mesh 
nailed to a stick killed flies. Layers and layers of stuff, a stratified human geology waiting to be on Earth. What would that look like? And my last line there then said, I'm on my way to find out. This is a place I would really urge anyone to go visit. It's a museum that these two young men, they were young men, they promised him that they would keep this homestead going. It's a museum like no other I've ever, it's all there, it's all still there. Now on this last section, I wanna show you a few people that have always have inspired me. I've always been drawn to stories about hardship and how someone has found a way to keep going. It's not unusual for writers to be drawn to that kind of dramatic story. And I think of them especially now. That's my only political statement. I was told not to make political statements, but I think of them especially now. I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip this one because of time. I'm gonna go right to here. We called this story Missing Molly. When you do this work, sometimes you need to ask hard questions and be there to listen to hard stories. This is Maggie and John Bish, parents of 16-year-old Molly Bish, who you see in this picture. Molly was a 16-year-old lifeguard who disappeared from Coleman's Pond in Warren, Massachusetts, who her mother had dropped off just 15 minutes earlier. The largest search for a missing person in the state's history followed with no sign of Molly. I want to write about Molly, but more so, how a family keeps going. How do you get up, make breakfast, put gas in your car, play with a grandchild, go to work amidst so much sadness and so much not knowing? Because I showed up at several events where they were speaking, they knew that I cared about their story. My hope has changed, Maggie told me. In the beginning, I was just wishing and hoping to see Molly. Then my hope became intertwined with faith. As time moved on, my hope changed. Now I hope she's not scared. Some days my fear grabs hold. Some days I want her to be in heaven and not be hurt. Some days we're hopeful we'll find her. Some days I feel desperate. John and Maggie found the most terrible kind of celebrity, but it seemed that wherever there were children, they'd be there with child identification kits. Each day, says John, we made a daily decision to live. You want to crawl under a rock, but our personal histories are hard work resolve and struggle. We have to advocate for families and children. We don't want any other family to experience this. We're on this river, Molly, Maggie told me, and the currents keep moving. We just have to hold on. Through everything, I try to be as controlled as I can be, John says. I have to, I worry so much about my family, but I feel if I let go, I'll lose whatever control I have. I have to use my intellect. I have to think. I finally asked the hardest question. I asked, I said, they know that marriages crack under such extraordinary strain. The mutual guilt, the simple fact that each mirrors the other's unbearable sorrow, that they also are missing. We made a promise to Molly, John said. We will stay together, we'll never stop looking. The day there is closure for me is a day they close the lid on my casket. Just the other day I came home, I heard loud music coming from the house. For a moment, just a fleeting moment, my heart stopped. I thought, Molly's home. It was a family friend cleaning the house. A few years later, Molly's body was found five miles from her home. The police had suspects. Some, the pieces fit exactly with the, photo, with the sketch R's and the fact that who the, their past history, but no arrest ever came from it.
This is Grace Corrigan, the mother of Crystal McCullough. My story ran on the 25th anniversary of the Challenger explosion. When I saw her at her home in Framingham, Massachusetts, where Krista had grown up, the walls were filled with photos. So many, it was as though a family album had been emptied on them. And there's a photo of Grace herself giving a commencement speech at Framingham University, where both mother and daughter had graduated. It was a commencement speech that Krista was supposed to give. I asked her, how did you do it? And that was the theme of my time with her. She was in her 80s then, a widow. I told her that in the days before my visit, I watched videos of the Challenger on the internet, and each time I heard, go all throttle up, my heart raced, and soon I couldn't watch it anymore. So I asked, how do you keep looking at that day? She says, you know how I do it? I know Krista would say, hey, Ma, I'm not here. It's a good message. What did I give my life for? You know I should be there doing it. I'm not. You can do it. And my family, everybody was in pain, Grace Corrigan told me. I mean, everybody. I knew they probably wished I'd just leave it alone. But look, I look at it this way. It happened. There was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't take it back. So I did what I thought Krista would want. Nobody ever agreed with me. I didn't explain myself to anybody. I did what I wanted to do. And Krista would have done what she wanted to do. I haven't regretted it. I know I help people feel good. Two more, two pictures here. This is Bill De La Rosa. It's Bill De La Rosa with his mother. Doing this work gives you permission to be thrust into the lives of exceptional people who likely would never know. Here's Bill De La Rosa at his graduation from Bowdoin College, where his commencement speech made everyone stand up and just applaud for what seemed like forever. And this is Bill with his mother in Mexico, where she was forced to be apart from her family for 14 years. Bill was born and raised in Arizona, his father an American citizen, his mother undocumented from Mexico. His mother followed the misguided advice of a lawyer and returned to Mexico thinking she would be granted legal visa since she had four American-born children and a naturalized American husband. She was mistaken. She was forbidden to return for at least 10 years Turned out it was longer than that. Bill was 15. His father was disabled. He became the head of his family now, while still a sophomore in high school. He kept the secret of his now different life from everyone at school. His older brother joined the Marines to send money home. He had to raise a nine-year-old sister, a four-year-old brother. He did the shopping the cleaning, the cooking, the caring of everyone. He had to be sure his young siblings made it to school, were fed, did their homework. But he was relentless. He became a top honor student, and Bowden gave him a full ride. And four years later, he graduated as the top Hispanic scholar in the country. He then earned a scholarship to Oxford for two master's degrees. His Oxford honors came after my story. I spent three days with Bill, and I was with him the night before and the day of his graduation. I asked him how he managed to become his high school's valedictorian, earn scholarships, be recruited by the best colleges, all while caring for his family. He grew silent for a few moments. I knew I had to stay hopeful, so we all had hope. And there's hope also for my mom. If I don't have hope, then she doesn't either. I said, perhaps the way I can give her hope is by showing her how I'm doing in school. So I've made myself just buckle down and go to school and get the job done. And when semester grades came out and rankings came out, I'd show her and say, look, mom, I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. 
if I just started wearing different masks. I became a different person in front of my friends, in front of my teachers, in front of my dad and my sister Naomi, in front of all, and in front of my mom. Always, I said, never give up. In February of this year, his mother came home. Bill is now getting his doctorate at Yale. His life goal is to be an immigration lawyer who will work towards finding the just way forward. I want you, if you go home, Google Bill De La Rosa, go to his website. I am certain we will hear from him doing something special on a national scale. You can watch him give a speech after the showing of a movie that a local college made about him. Without this work, I never would have known Bill. I never would have known his story. I'm the better for knowing it. I would not have been able to let you know about him and how he never gave in to despair, no matter what. Remember that. Now I want to thank you for listening. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I think we should extend by an extra hour. <laughs> but there's a reception to follow, so we don't want to miss that. Questions, comments, preferably questions. Take the mic, please. In your travels in me, did you run across John? No, I did not. Be, I, the reason being that. Uh, excuse me, just repeat the question. Okay. Um, in my travels in Maine, did I ever get to know or write about John Martin, the Speaker of the House? Yankee so rarely does political stories. That was the reason. The only. Uh, Bill Cohen was an exception. I think once I remember we did Margaret Chase Smith, and a long time ago we did this young guy named Bernie Sanders. <laughs> well, stories to share never does politics. <laughs> Who's next? Well, I'm going to ask this question. How do you decide from one issue to the next uh, what gets on the cutting room floor? What's that process? For the whole magazine, for the whole magazine, yes. Those decisions are made um, actually long before the act. we have to go to a cutting room floor. We have what's called an issue planner. I have a remarkable staff. I have an amazing managing editor, and we work together. Actually, we come together many Sunday mornings, actually, at Yankee, and we do these planners. So right now we have 2025 pretty well planned out, and we put page numbers for each one, page numbers, which then translate to how many words. And then we have an amazing photo editor who looks at this planner and says, what am I supposed to do about the fall, the fall story if we don't have good foliage, things like that. And so we plan ahead so we know that next fall, we've already shot it, of course, this fall. So everything is done a, a year ahead. Uh, excuse me. Take the mic. Okay, I, I will tell you about Rosie the elephant, but it has to be another question after this. So this is not the end note. Okay. <laughs> so Rosie made it to hope. Hold it. Jim Lorita, who I came very, very fond of, just a wonderful guy. One day he went out to feed Rosie in the morning, and apparently he slipped and fell and got knocked out. Now, an elephant's natural instinct is to help you. And Rosie crushed him. Aww. So that's why I can't be the last story. Um, but um, so Rosie had to go to another farm and all that. But the story was still a great story, how this little town came together, a town smaller than Jack. 
Do you have a short story about Bernie Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> we did Bernie Sanders when he was the mayor of Burlington. He was not yet Bernie Sanders. He was the mayor of Burlington. It was about how this guy from New York, you know, got to be the elected the socialist mayor of a Vermont town. If you remember how Vermont used to be quite Republican, people may forget that. But so that was, that's what that story was. Hi, Mel. It's Lauren. Hi. I just, are you going to do a book? You know, I, I, I teach in a, in, a, in a master's program of writing Bait Path, and they, they've been urging me, former students have been urging me, and I love that question because it's a, sometimes you need that thing. So the more I think about it, I think it would be a heck of a good book, frankly. Yes. Yeah. Just a second. <laughs> Repeat the question. Did you oh, get the I, question? I was asked, Gina asked me if I would come back and do part two. That, that would be in the book. Part two would be in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Just a question. I've always wondered, you used to have a small format magazine. Yeah. You went to the standard format. I always wondered why you did that. So don't say you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Some, sometimes decisions are made for business reasons that have nothing at all to do with the editor. And in this case, the feeling was the trend was to have something, let's say, more than, other, more than a younger demographic might gravitate to, and especially the advertising agencies. More and more we're having younger people in the advertising agencies. That little small format that you love, that I love, and much of my staff loves because it was so easy to get carried everywhere. You know, um, those younger people in advertising agencies say, "Well, our ad doesn't look so good that way. That, you're, that's funky. That's idiosyncratic. We don't do idiosyncratic." That was a big reason. I want you to know that just like you guys said, you, um, I got the I got the heat for that. Um, and I remember the one I always remember is a uh, a beauty parlor, a hair salon in Keene got me on the phone, she said, I have a whole room full here of women who are angry at you because <laughs> they used to be able to carry Yankee in their, in their bag coming to get their hair done. So, what can I say? One more. Mel, what are the borders of Yankee? How far afield will you go? That's a great question. Um, there is, for many, many years, we just stayed to the six states, of course. And then there was a time when we thought, we, we did a section called Beyond Our Borders, and that was done also for business reasons. And because we know our readers, all of you, don't just stay in these six states. You travel, you go to Florida, you go to whatever, you go to maybe Hawaii, maybe you go to Bahamas. And so there was a, a time when we actually did a, story on the Bahamas. We actually did a story in Florida. We did a story on Mammoth Cave, etc. Um, there's talk about maybe revisiting that um, just for that reason. But if you're going, if you're going to be a regional magazine and it only comes out, we used to come out 12 times a year. We come out six times a year now. So if you're going to take this precious little six times a year and you then you write about the Adirondacks, which is kind of New England anyway. So but we, we, we Last year, we did um, Quebec City, for example, as a photo essay. Because we had this wonderful photographer, a great photographer who lived in Quebec City, and we thought, let's try this out again. And um, if we had 12 issues a year and more pages, we could, I think we could make a really good argument to have stories where readers will actually go to, especially in winter. Mel, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Next month. Oh, sorry. I did. I did.
I'm going to get this on. <laughs> How do you get? That's one of the ones I, I couldn't talk about because time ran out. There you go. On December 6th, Ophelia Dahl, if you want to come, please register soon because we already have more than half the seats uh, assigned. People have registered. Ophelia Dahl has a home here in the Monadnock region. Time Magazine this year selected her as one of the 100 most influential people, not women, people in the United States. And it's, uh, it's going to be worth attending. So please have that in mind and uh, tell your friends and come back next month. I want to thank all of you for coming, Mel. I really appreciate this so much. It was perfect from the beginning to end. I'd like uh, to thank Nancy Beltet and John Duvall who have put together the reception. Please stay. It's out in the reception area and the conference room. And to conclude, let me introduce the president of the Jaffrey Civic Center, David Beltet. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I'd also like to make a few commercial announcements. Uh, upstairs, currently, we have the fall open show. If you care to meander around while you're still here. Uh, in the auditorium, we have the photography presentation by Ethan Abbott. Uh, Joe spoke about the next story to share. Um, in November, we will, in November 16th, the students of Artist Betty Glass will have a show here. Also, uh, upstairs will be the Emergence, presented by the Women's Conference of the Arts of New Hampshire, the Tonight Show. Uh, and, and, uh, and in the discussion in the lobby will be Women, Artistry, and Glass. So please uh, have a look at our website and 